Well, thank you, Peter, for that very nice introduction. You're giving me much more credit than I deserve. Um, I'm honored today to be here on the occasion of the Historical Society's annual meeting and also honored to share the podium with Professor Nemiroff. So I think um, that you all join in my delight that the arts at Stanford are going through this renaissance. However, as we celebrate what has recently been accomplished, I think it's important to be aware of the work of the past and to recognize those who established the foundation and set the stage, so to speak, for the current splendid state of the arts at Stanford. And I might add that often those advances were made at a time when the arts weren't necessarily a priority on the campus. So focusing for the most part on the Department of Art and the Stanford Museum, my talk today will give an overview of a few important moments that changed the course of the arts at Stanford, recognizing those individuals who made a special or unusual difference. So as Stanford celebrates its 125th anniversary, I think it is fitting that we start with the university's founders who believed that the arts were essential to a broad education. Jane Stafford particularly was a champion for the arts, and she made sure that the arts had an important place in the founding of the university. The museum, which was Jane's most cherished project, is included in the university's founding grant, and she also ensured that the arts would be a part of the curriculum from the beginning. Jane first engaged... Oh, do I do that? <laughs> All right. So Jane first engaged an artist, Bolton Brown, to come to Stanford to create the Department of Art. A painter, he had recently received his degree from Syracuse University. The image you see on the screen is one of his works. He served as chair of the department from 1891 until 1902. However, he and Jane came into disagreement over his use of nude models in his classes. <laughs> She first insisted that the class be separated by gender, and then she eventually dictated that no nude models would be used at all. And so in 1902, Brown resigned. Now during the next 60 years, there were perhaps only four other chairs of the department. Uh, one faculty member, Arthur Bridgman Clark, was actually chair for 29 years. The art curriculum in those early years was limited in scope and depth. And for the most part, it focused on the graphic arts. Little, if any, art history was taught. For a time, art was affiliated with the education department, and then it moved to the humanities. The Department of Art then had a very small number of faculty and students, and classes were held in several locations throughout campus. But I think it was interesting to note that there were several, um, there was a strong representation of women artists on the faculty in the early years. I believe I counted something like 14 women artists were on the faculty, so I found that very interesting. In the late 1940s through the early 1960s, the department was able to expand faculty numbers and curriculum. During these early years, however, art was not a priority at Stanford and the arts departments were supported with very modest budgets. But today, I've been asked to narrow my talk primarily on what I refer to as the Eitner years, the period between the mid-1960s through the late 1980s during the leadership of Lawrence Eitner. I worked in the art department, as Peter said, starting in 1970, and I stayed for about 23 years before moving permanently to the museum. So that's the period of the time in the department that I know best. First, I found Lawrence to be a very effective leader. He was quite remarkable, actually. A distinguished scholar and prolific writer, he received prestigious awards for his books on Jericho. He was an excellent and popular teacher, receiving Stanford's Gord's Award for Excellence in Teaching, and he was a very, very wise administrator. He had great resolve and focus. And perhaps not so well known, he was very talented at drawing. He had a devastating and sardonic wit and often entertained us with his humorous drawings which usually pointed out pretense in his subjects, which were individuals of very high stature, usually at the university. Now, I, I considered showing a couple of these, and as I went through them, I decided it was probably best not to bring them to public attention. <laughs> so the Eitner years were crucially important to the history of the department and the museum. Indeed, without his vision and accomplishments, I don't believe that the visual arts at Stanford would be where they are today. 
the museum likely would not be standing because if at the time of the 1989 earthquake, the museum had still remained in its early neglectful state, it likely would have been permanently closed. So in the early 1960s, the Dean of the School of Humanities and Sciences, Robert Sears, recruited Lawrence to Stanford from the University of Minnesota, where he had taught for 14 years. Lawrence often spoke to us about his recruitment visit to Stanford. He was very impressed with Dean Sears, who had presented a glowing picture of the university in the hope of building a first-rate art department. But looking back on that visit, Lawrence felt it probably had been too brief that he should have given himself more time to get a better sense of the condition of the department. He accepted the offer of the chairmanship and arrived in Stanford in 1963. He soon discovered that his charge was much more daunting than he realized when he came to interview. He now was dismayed at what he saw as the deep neglect in which the art had languished at Stanford for decades. The department did not have a proper building, and he often talked about the teaching spaces in Geology Corner as dismal without an art library or other crucial resources. I recall him talking about his first letter, le lecture when the AV equipment didn't work. Sears had also invited him to direct the museum, which Lawrence found was in even worse condition and not fit as a teaching function, which was, very, which was very important to him. So he saw the major task before him as building from scratch. But Lawrence had a very clear vision for what he wanted to accomplish, and systematically he went about the work to reach his goal of bringing the Department of Art to the level of those of other top universities. So his first task was to raise funds for a much needed building, with facilities on a level with those of the foremost departments in the field and other institutions. An interesting note in the record shows that $2.5 million was needed for the building. A very large sum at the time, nevertheless, as a former fundraiser, that did make me smile. With the development office, he secured a naming commitment from Nathan Cummings and another from Walter Annenberg for an auditorium for the building. With these and other smaller commitments and university support, plans moved forward for a 52,000 square foot building to be designed by John Carl Warnicke. Lawrence was very pleased with the building site, located in mid-campus between the art gallery and the, muse and the main library, which he saw as presenting convenient access to resources for research and exhibition. The Cummings Art Building was completed ahead of schedule and was dedicated in 1968. It had teaching spaces for art history and studio facilities for painting, sculpture, photography, and design. There was also a large art library and an auditorium seating 350 people. The two areas, actually, art history and studio art, continue today in a wonderful design in the McMurtry Building. And this is a distinctive aspect uh, at Stanford. It is unusual for universities to house their art history and studio art in the same department. Usually those are two separate departments. In 1963, department faculty numbers were quite small, particularly in art, art history. As Peter mentioned, it really was not uh, a, a department that offered that much art history. It was mostly studio art. And so at the same time he was working on the building, Lawrence began to recruit a strong faculty of scholars and practicing artists with budget support from the dean. He recruited scholars such as Albert Elston in modern and contemporary art, Michael Sullivan in Chinese art, and in the Renaissance, Kurt Forster, who later went on to direct the Getty Center for the History of Art and Humanities. Noted Bay Area artists, Nathan Oliveira and Frank Lobdell were among the studio faculty he recruited. You see here a photograph of Nathan in his print studio. It was taken by Leo Hollow, a very well-known Stanford photographer, and also one of Nathan's paintings. So by 19, uh, 1971, with the addition of Paul Turner in architectural history, the faculty had increased as planned, with 11 art historians and eight studio instructors, all distinguished in their fields. The curriculum included courses in ancient, medieval, Renaissance, Baroque, 18th and 19th century, American, modern and contemporary, and Asian art, as well as architectural history. And there were studio courses in painting, sculpture, photography, printmaking, and design. So in less than 10 years, the department was now among the nation's 10 best institutions in both areas of teaching. It included a slide collection of more than 200,000 slides and an art library of 107,000 volumes. The faculty roster continued to expand over the years. In the early 1980s, Wanda Korn, an historian of American art, arrived and soon after Melinda Takeuchi in the field of Japanese art. 
a young scholar, Jody Maxman, who would become one of the undergraduate population's most popular teachers, filled the ancient art history billet vacated by Isabel Raubacek. A new young studio artist joined the department in painting, photography, and design. Soon after his arrival, Lawrence also began to bring visiting artists to campus for residencies. Among these was the artist Richard Diebenkorn. Diebenkorn is the most well-known artist to graduate from the art department. He came to Stanford in 1940 for three years, left for service in World War II, and returned again to get his BA in 1949. He studied primarily under Daniel Mendelowitz, an artist on the faculty who was a respected watercolorist in the area at that time. At Lawrence's invitation, Deben Korn, now an artist of, a, of quite a, much acclaim, returned to Stanford for a visiting artist residency in the 1963-64 academic year. A few years ago, Connie Wolf, the museum's current dynamic director, developed a warm friendship with Deben Korn's widow, Phyllis, who was also a Stanford graduate. This resulted in Phyllis giving to the Cantor Art Center 29 of his sketchbooks, including 1,045 drawings spanning some 50 years. This gift is a very special, special addition to the Cantor collection and a wonderful resource for teaching. The image you see here is a drawing from one of the sketchbooks, which are featured in an exhibition at the Cantor right now through August 22nd, so I encourage you to pay a vis visit if you haven't seen it yet. By the late 1960s, the department also was now offering advanced degree programs, the PhD in art history, and the MFA in studio art. The first MFAs were awarded in the late 1960s and the first PhDs in 1971. The MFA would eventually become among the most sought after graduate studio programs in the country with 250 applications for five open slots each year. The TA PhD program in art history eventually would be ranked among the top six programs in the country. A unique design program was also begun jointly with the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Students could either enter in the art department or mechanical engineering. They would get either the MA, the MFA, or a Bachelor of Science from mechanical engineering. And Stanford began now to produce the young artists and scholars who would become future leaders in the arts. David Kelly, a graduate of the design program, is the creative mind behind Stanford's Hasso Plotner Institute of Design, otherwise known as the D School which continues to receive acclaim for its basic theory of design thinking, which can be applied to any field. Advanced degree recipients have gone on to careers as faculty at universities throughout the country. Just a few examples are Carrie Jones, the professor of art history at MIT, David Cataforis, chair of the art history department at the University of Kansas, Cecile Whiting, a chancellor's professor at the University of California, Irvine, and Keith Egener, the Ross Distinguished Professor of Architectural History at the University of Oregon. Also, we have Peter Brown, Professor in Photography at Rice University in Houston, whose work you see here on the screen. Many also have opted, opted for distinguished museum careers, including Kirk Varnado, the former Director of Painting at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the current Director of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Neil Benezra. So I've already mentioned that the dean casually included the museum when offering Lawrence the chairmanship of the department. Lawrence liked to emphasize that he directed the museum without pay. However, the museum is in very sad condition. After Jane Stanford's death in 1905 and the earthquake of 1906, the university interest in the museum had been non-existent. The earthquake destroyed two thirds of the collections and buildings and the museum was severely neglected, records weren't kept, artworks were stolen, and the doors finally closed in 1945. In the mid 1950s, a few interested volunteers began to work on the collections and helped to reopen the doors to the public. Nevertheless, very few of the 21 galleries were in use and many spaces were occupied by other departments such as biology and anthropology. Even as late as 1970 when I arrived, I remember uh, getting a tour of the museum and there was actually a shark in formaldehyde in the basement, <laughs> left over from the biology department. I, I actually don't remember when the shark left us. It would have been quite a celebration. But Lawrence loved working with objects and he saw the museum's potential as a teaching resource. And so as he was building the department, he also tackled the revival of the Stanford Museum. As he did with the department, Lawrence went about the museum's rebirth systematically, overseeing the gradual removal of departments he referred to as squatters, <laughs> and in 
and the renovation of each gallery, he refocused the museum on fine art and began to build the collections, exhibition, and education programs. It's important to understand that being chair of the department as well as director of the museum, Lawrence looked at the two units as one, and he developed both with an overall vision in mind. Consequently, the two units were very closely aligned. He drew on department resources of scholarship and expertise, enlisting most art history faculty as honorary curators, and the museum now provided opportunities for study, original research, and publication. The department staff also had responsibilities for the museum. For example, for several years, my responsibilities included overseeing gift funds, donor relations, the museum's membership group, the Committee for Art at Stanford, and the volunteer community education program. Because of the museum having limited funding and staff, the work of the museum's volunteers played a major role in what the staff was able to accomplish in many areas. That service continues today through a core numbering some 350 active volunteers in the museum. Among them are the museum's docents, a program that has expanded now to include the Anderson Collection and that has provided amazing service to the museum for more than 50 years. The museum's membership organization is another important aspect of the institution's history. Begun in the 1950s by volunteers, strengthened in the Eitner years, and considerably expanded when the museum reopened in 1999. This group has provided dependable and ever-increasing annual support for museum programs, staffing, and acquisitions. Today, it has broadened to become a joint membership of the Cantor Arts Center and the Anderson Collection. When Lawrence began to invent inventory the remnants of the Stanford collections, he found them very depleted and in chaotic disorder, mostly undocumented and difficult to identify. As he oversaw the gradual restoration of the museum's interior, he also began to undertake a plan of conservation, labeling, and cataloging of works appropriate for exhibition. He relied greatly on the help and expertise of members of the faculty. Building the collections was a primary focus, and the majority of available funding at the museum was directed to that purpose. Collecting was largely centered on master drawings and prints from the 15th century to the present, with emphasis on the 18th and 19th centuries. In 1970, Betsy Freiberger was hired as the first curator of prints and drawings, and this would later become the McMurtry curator of prints and drawings. She was an important partner to Lawrence in the acquisition of a body of work that today remains one of the highlights of the Cantor's collection. Lawrence also took advantage of the art market to acquire important paintings from time to time. And the work of Anita Mosley, who doubled as registrar and curator, strengthened the photography holdings. A staff of only six, consisting of two curators, a registrar, a secretary, a carpenter, and two installation specialists, actually I guess it was seven, <laughs> accomplished a great deal. Some 300 exhibitions of varying sizes and 40 publications were produced during this time. And it was done with a very modest budget. I remember even as late as 1990, the museum's annual budget was only $32,000, including salaries. Acquisition funds were raised by volunteers in their biennial treasure market, and exhibition funds were provided by the membership organization. The beautiful image you see here is of a young mill worker of 1904 by the photographer Lewis Hine. And before going on to the next slide, I want to mention that Professor Nemiroff has just organized an exhibition for the Cantor Arts Center. It's titled Soul Maker, The Times of Lewis Hine. And the exhibition includes a selection of Hines' child labor photographs of the very early 1900s. And they're juxtaposed with contemporary photographs by a young photographer, Jason Francisco, of the same mill and factory sites as they look now. Jason is actually a 1998 Stanford MFA graduate. So the exhibition opens uh, later this week on May 21st and runs through October 24th. So please put that on your calendar. I'm looking forward to it. In the 1970s, Professor Albert Elson struck up a friendship with a well-known financier and collector, B. Gerald Cantor, who began donating Rodin sculpture to the museum. Al eventually entertained the hope of establishing a garden for Rodin works, but there was very little interest in the project from the university administration, the dean, or even from Lawrence Eitner. But once Al had his mind made up, he was relentless. Almost single-handedly, he raised the funds for and oversaw the planning of the B. Gerald Cantor Rodin Sculpture Garden, which was dedicated in 1985 and remains one of the major destinations at Stanford to this day. Al was also instrumental in bringing contemporary outdoor sculpture to the campus, 
and oversaw sightings throughout Stanford of works by artists such as Joseph Albers, Henry Moore, Miro, Alexander Calder, and George Siegel. Today, the outdoor art collection is one of the highlights of the university's landscape. Harry and Margaret Anderson, who recently made the gift of the magnificent Anderson Collection to Stanford, credit Al for his early guidance of their collecting. This friendship was one of the initial connections between the Andersons and Stanford. Al passed away in 1995. Had he lived, he would have been so delighted that this important collection finally rests at Stanford. And now we come to uh, the year 1989, which saw a significant change in the department and museum due to two things, Lawrence Eitner's retirement and the subsequent Loma Prieta earthquake. Lawrence had left the department and museum with excellent reputations and positioned well for the future. Upon his retirement in 1989, the position of chair, which he had held for 26 years, became a rotating one every three to five years. At the same time, the administration decided to separate the leadership of the museum department and establish the first full-time museum directorship, a decision that eventually would create a shift in the interaction between department faculty and the museum. Wanda Korn was appointed the new department chair in August of 1989, and she arrived that fall with new energy and fresh ideas. Just two months later, the earthquake severely damaged and closed the museum, and Wanda was asked also to assume the museum directorship on an interim basis. I recall joking with her at the time, saying that while I knew she was aware that as department chair she was going to wear many hats, I'm sure she hadn't anticipated that one of those hats would be a hard hat. I believe that the importance of Corn's leadership at that time often is forgotten due to the fact that it was for such short duration, just two years. However, her leadership of the department and museum during this critical period was crucial. The earthquake had caused campus-wide damage, including the main library and the quad, as well as the museum. So this was a time of great uncertainty for the museum staff, who for many months didn't know if the university was going to allow the museum to reopen and rebuild. Wanda was a master negotiator, however, and was respected and well-liked by the administration. She, along with several members of the Board of Trustees, as well as the Committee for Art at Stanford, led the way for the university's decision to move ahead with the museum rebuilding and to reopen the search for a museum director. As the search moved forward, we also began to decouple the administration of the Department of Museum, which had proved to be complicated. All museum responsibilities held by department staff were now transferred to museum staff, with the exception of my position. I still had responsibilities in both units as there was no one in the museum who could take on donor and volunteer relations because remember there still was only seven staff members in the museum. Wanda Korn provided the bridge between the Eitner years and the future of the department and museum and she led well. However, after only two years, she was asked to leave to direct the Stanford Humanities Center, which meant that the department would have three chairs in a very short period of time. As changes were occurring in the art department, the museum was undergoing a major transition. Thomas K. Seligman, the new director, was introduced at the museum's 100th anniversary celebration in August of 1991. Of course, the museum was closed and wouldn't open for another eight years. Tom often referred to the museum as a 100-year startup because of its unusual and erratic history. Tom was a strong leader and his skills were well matched for the task at hand. He first had to focus on the struggle to get the museum project underway, and a struggle it was. It was a complex project that included renovating and seismically strengthening the historic museum and constructing a new 42,000 square foot wing. He was dealing with historical building requirements, the county, FEMA, the university's planning office, as well as the architects. And the staff were conducting a complete inventory of the 40,000 object collection, the first of its kind. There was also significant fundraising to be done. With this in mind, in 1993, our associate dean asked me to take a leave from the department from one year to help Tom with fundraising, and later that year I was appointed director of development in a newly created permanent position. It was really a difficult time because fundraising had really slowed um, and so much to the point because the university would not let us move ahead with the building project until we had a certain amount of money in hand. And uh, Tom even, I mean, it got to the point where Tom was even looking at the art gallery and considering how he might um, run a museum program through the art gallery. So once the principal commitment, though, from the Cantors was secured, the building project did get underway. Tom had to turn his attention to building a staff 
and overseeing the planning of the first 18 months of changing exhibitions, as well as the complex reinstallation of the collections in the remaining 18 galleries. We also began planning extensive opening celebrations and began the first efforts to raise an endowment to ensure the long-term financial health of the museum. With great fanfare, the museum reopened, significantly expanded as the Cantor Art Center in January of 1999 and was received extremely well. Some 17,000 people came in the doors for the four days of opening. An increased popularity of the revived museum with a greatly diversified exhibitions program resulted in a strengthened community focus. The department, of course, had its own goals and opportunities. Over the next several years, the faculty began to undergo change through attrition. New younger faculty members were approaching art history differently. The studio area too was changing. Faculty and student work now was much more multidisciplinary and included new media. For example, the work you see here is by Paul Demarinus, an electronic media artist on the faculty. In, his sound, in this sound sculpture titled The Edison Effect, old gramophone records, wax cylinders, and holograms are scanned with lasers to produce faint music. A digital lab was soon established in the department and the curriculum of both art history and studio di diversified and became more interdisciplinary. During the almost 10 years of closure, the museum had run the exhibition program through the Stanford Art Gallery. After the museum reopened in 1999, the art gallery was turned over to department management and exhibitions in that venue became an extension of the department's programs. New leadership and subsequent separation of the department and museum had also changed the dynamic between the two institutions considerably. Lawrence had looked at the two areas as one, with each benefiting the other, and had revived the museum as primarily a laboratory for the department. Now the museum began to serve departments and programs beyond the art department and to build many new partnerships across campus. The director and curators also continued to reach out to the art department, however, there was less interest in the museum from the faculty. I'm not suggesting there was anything negative going on. The relationship was quite cordial and there was still some partnerships and some joint programs. It simply was a case of two units with new leadership, new players, operating separately with separate goals. However, the museum's ever-increasing strength and prominence over the years after reopening would set the stage for a soon-to-come transformative period for all the arts at Stanford. In the early part of the last decade, as university leaders began to plan for a major comprehensive campaign, they were considering several interdisciplinary initiatives, including the biosciences, the environment, and international studies. An earlier campus-wide assessment had shown the need for several arts objectives, which at the time focused mainly on buildings, a new concert hall, the renovation of the Knoll for the music department, and a new building for the art department, the latter initiated in part because Hoover Institution wanted to expand and was interested in the site where the Cummings building stood. We kept hearing about the possibility of some kind of arts initiative, and this went on for some time, but the idea never seemed to get any traction. I suggested to Tom Seligman that we invite leaders in the various arts departments for lunch in the museum to talk about what might be possible. At the meeting, I talked with them about the campaign that was in the planning stages and suggested that they not pass up the opportunity to advance the arts with a vision beyond just new buildings. From that first meeting, Brian Wolf, a professor in the art department, emerged as someone with a vision for what might be possible. Jonathan Berger from the music department soon joined Brian in leading the way. Planning began to escalate along the lines similar in scale to the other multidisciplinary university initiatives. The core of the initiative focused on creativity and its importance to all fields, and the goal was to ensure that all students would have opportunities to engage with the arts. John Hennessy was enormously supportive of the, arts, of the arts during the campaign and throughout his presidency. He and his wife, Andrea, remain champions of the arts. John also assigned Roberta Katz from his office to work closely on the initiative, and he also engaged Gerhard Casper to lead a faculty advisory committee to guide the planning. From his arrival on campus in 2002, Gerhardt had been very supportive of the arts. He has a deep knowledge of art and architecture and his support of the museum as we worked to get it rebuilt was critical. In addition to my work at the museum, I was appointed director of development in the arts initiative for a little over a year. And I continue to be so grateful for the opportunity I had to be part of that initial planning and to establish the foundation for the campaign. It was just an inspiring time to be involved. The Arts Initiative was the first time that the arts at Stanford were approached holistically and promoted as a major component of a campaign. 
Suddenly the Irish were receiving a great deal of attention. I recall watching a Stanford football game at home one day, one Saturday on, on television, and of course cheering for our team. But I was also cheering at halftime when an ad came on featuring John Hennessy promoting the importance of the arts at Stanford. The initiative benefited all the arts during the campaign and subsequently. In addition to support from the McMurtry Building, several professorships were established in the art department. They include the Victoria and Roger Sand Professorship in Art, which brought Nancy Choi to chair the department for several years and to oversee the in-depth planning for the creation of the McMurtry Building. The Toma Provostial Professorship in the Arts and Humanities and Halpern Professorships in American Art and Photography. There was also additional support for studio classes and other needs. Much later, discussions would begin between the President's Office and the Andersons, which resulted in the establishment of the Anderson Collection at Stanford. At the museum, we were able to make remarkable progress on building the endowment, and with attention on the arts, more and more donors were offering works of art to the museum. So we now have this great complex that has brought the visual arts together as never before. It started with the revival and thriving success of the museum, advanced with the opening of the Anderson Collection. And now the spectacular, uniquely designed McMurtry Building, home of the Department of Art, completes the picture. My office was on the second floor of the museum overlooking the South Lawn, and I watched the McMurtry Project as it took shape day by day. But I retired in March of 2015 before the project was completed. And my only regret was that I was not going to see student life right out my window and be part of this wonderful opportunity for collaboration that I predicted would change the culture of our museum. Proximity, of course, is not enough for a vital partnership. However, the rubbing of shoulders, as Gerhard Casper often said, can have wonderful serendipitous results. I mentioned before that Tom Seligman often referred to the museum as a 100-year startup. I believe that more broadly, the arts at Stanford could be looked at as a 125-year startup. The arts have come a long way through the work of many, just some of whom I've been able to talk about today. But there's still much work to be done. There's still a long way to go. So I really look forward to hearing what Professor Nemiroff will tell us about plans for the future. Now, the one area that I really haven't covered too much in this is the importance of our donors and volunteers to, our, uh, to all the arts at Stanford. And looking through the audience, I see many good friends of the arts, people who have supported the arts as donors, as volunteers, there's some staff people here. But I just want you to know how deeply grateful I am to have worked with all of you. I would like to be able to call out each one of your names, but of course time does not permit that. But I'm deeply grateful for your generosity and support that has meant so much to bringing the arts to where they are today at Stanford. And I think I've touched something here, so I'm gonna have to go very quickly. I knew that was going to happen. I thought it would happen sooner. Um, so anyway, thank you so much, all of you uh, that have participated in the arts. Now, before, wait, not yet, not yet. But before I turn it back to Professor Stansky, I, I'm going to leave you with a story. One day in 1992, when I was still based in the art department, I was working alone in my office, and I looked up and I saw a young man standing in the doorway, whom I assumed was an undergraduate student arriving early for the quarter. He was so young. I asked if I could help him, and he said, hello, I'm Alex Nemiroff, and I'm, I'm just checking in. Now, Alex was considered to be a rising young star in the field of American art. He had recently completed his doctoral degree at Yale, and the department had brought him to Stanford to be a visiting lecturer in American art, a temporary position. That year, I had the opportunity to work on an important gift to the department that would significantly strengthen the American art program. The gift included an endowment for a faculty billet, four years of annual visiting, uh, support for an annual visiting distinguished scholar, and four full graduate fellowships. Now, when establishing a new billet at Stanford, it's required that you get the dean's approval, so I did go to speak to the dean at the time, was George Thomas. And he told me that he was trying to secure junior faculty billets um, and uh, he asked that I go back to the department and work it out with the faculty, which I did. And that year, the department was able to offer Alex, after an appropriate search, of course, this new tenure track junior position. And I think the department kept him for about nine years before Yale lured him back and he stayed there for a few years. But I was delighted to hear in 2012 that Alex was going to return to Stanford to be the first recipient of the top. Toma, Provostial Chair in the Arts and Humanities. 
So I'm very pleased with myself that I had just a small role in helping <laughs> to connect this exceptional scholar and inspiring teacher to Stanford. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll have some time for, for probably have some time for, for questions uh, after after Alex's talk. It's it's a great uh, pleasure for me uh, to introduce uh, Alex Nemiroff. Uh, he holds a you've heard a bit about his career from Mona. He he holds a degree a PhD from Yale. He was junior faculty here, and then he was lured back to Yale where he, he, he uh, stayed for a while, culminating in being, uh, having the chair, I believe, the Vincent Scully chair in, in art history. Uh, Vincent Scully, a, a legendary teacher, and Alex himself uh, became a, a legendary teacher at Yale and has been an extraordinary teacher here. He also is an extremely eminent scholar uh, with with various and many publications, uh, most recently a, a series of publications uh, dealing with the American photography, wartime kiss about war, uh, which I think the title is from the famous photograph I think of the couple in in Times Square, uh, and then succeeding that uh, a, w a wonderful study uh, of of his uh, of the relationship. Uh, between his father, Howard Nemiroff, and his father's sister, and Alex's aunt, uh, Diane Arbus. And then uh, now, as Mona mentioned, uh, just published, uh, recently published by Princeton, uh, a, a book about Lewis Hine, and tied in with the exhibition, which is, opens at the Cantor uh, on Saturday. So I'm very, very pleased. I'm very, very grateful for Mona for giving us a wonderful talk, and I'm grateful that Alex will now talk, talk about the present and the future. Uh, th <clears throat> thank you, Peter. Um, uh, thank you all. Thank you, Mona for your remarks and for um, the backstory of how I came to remain at Stanford. I'm thinking that, uh, you know, I met my wife here later in the 90s um, in San Francisco and uh, think about her and about my daughters and I guess I owe you a little thanks for that because, uh, of course, I should... Uh, give myself credit too because uh, if I didn't go to that bar that night I never would have met her either so <laughs> okay so I'd like to talk about the past uh, a little bit and then the present and the future just very briefly so um, you know the past I, I can't help but feel a little um, tang of sadness when I see the site of the Cummings building and um, it was kind of beautiful in the way it was just a blank space for it seemed about 36 hours. Um, but now with it being eradicated, um, you know, it does make me feel uh, as a historian disappointed at the way the past disappears without a trace. Uh, I'm teaching a seminar right now called Ghosts, which is about the relationship between history and haunting. You know, historians, art historians are people who are haunted by the past. And uh, I even gave that as an option for one of my students to write about, to write about Cum Cummings or Meyer for that matter. Well, no one, no one took, took them up, took me up on my offer. They opted for more charismatic things like uh, uh, Jane Stanford, um, and some, some other things that I almost wish I never knew about <laughs> that have happened on campus, but I guess I'll be learning about in the final papers. So anyway, that building or the lack of it makes me think foremost of Al Elson, who from when I arrived here in 1992, uh, you know, was a mentor to me, uh, in part because I think I 
somehow had the wisdom to learn to know not to say much around Al and just let him talk uh, to me, which I think Al valued in me as a interlocutor. <laughs> so, um, um, but uh, you know, it 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 gives me some sadness to think of Al. Of course, Al is present uh, now via the sculptures all around campus, but he's also kind of not present, or it feels like a part of him is lost with the disappearance of that building. But I myself can look at Al's face if I go into the common room in uh, the kitchen area, copy area, the kind of least glamorous part of our new suite of administrative offices in the new McMurtry building, because there, uh, unceremoniously, there's a photograph uh, affixed to the fridge of, um, from 1989 of the art and art history department as it looked uh, all of the faculty and staff posing before the Miro sculpture in the now obliterated courtyard. And the thing that strikes me as I look at that photograph, and it's not a photograph, but rather a photocopy of the photograph, is just how um, how serious everyone looks, you know. And uh, it's kind of off-putting to me, not that I'm not serious, but they look a t even a tad on the glum side, and I imagine that the photographer told everyone to look very serious. Even the dog, who is a lassie-like lassie, <laughs> lassie -like dog, looks... Uh, well, it's hard, it's hard for me to say, but it certainly has a kind of deportment in the, in the photograph. So um, it seems like a, somehow a kind of forlorn place for these people to have wound up on the fridge. Uh, um, so I think about that a lot when I go in that room. Um, but the present, um, you know, I think it's no secret that even as we have the extraordinary good fortune to be located now in this magnificent building and to be benefiting from it in all sorts of ways, that the challenge of um, the arts at Stanford is perhaps what it's always been or for a long time been, though maybe more accentuated now. And what is that challenge? I was thinking about it. I think it has to do with the, pay, the way the arts are hated and loved on campus. And I'll just try to explain what I mean by that. I think hated doesn't need too much of explanation, but there is a sense of the arts here, not among those of us, and not among administrators, and not among donors, but among the undergraduates, as a, a, I'll just call it like it is, as a useless adornment to life. Um, and that's a very difficult culture to budge, and one, as a professor, imagines oneself changing it incrementally as one can, but uh, the love is interesting and in a way more burdensome, for me at least, because I've noticed around here, you know, a, a certain feeling uh, that everything is art, and do it with art. Have, a, have some art, have some aesthetics. Do your thing and put some aesthetics on it too. And you know, among other things one could say is it's so insulting to uh, who and what an artist might be to think that every, everyone is an artist. Everyone curates their experience. There's a word that's making, is becoming too ubiquitous, I think. Um, and the notion of what art is seems to me uh, important to articulate as opposed to what it is not. And to do so without being a curmudgeon and a scold and a jerk, well, that's a challenge. And it's, um, <laughs> but I'm a hopeful person and I never, I am. I, I don't try to teach from a position of resentment or bitterness ever. Um, so, you know, I was at a, I was at a, Stanford uh, dorm event recently and someone asked me to one of these students uh, we, we were talking about art and they said uh, well uh, what did I think of the way that a computer program I guess had recently made it possible to recreate all the paintings of Rembrandt uh, down to the last brushstroke with extraordinary accuracy and and the student being young and, and nice too uh, looked at me hopefully to get my sense of this 
uh, development. And, you know, I tried to be nice and I thought about it for a moment and I said, well, it's probably the end of human civilization. <laughs> So, uh, but that, that brings me to what is, what is the place of uh, the faculty here and the administrators and so on in this, because it's one thing to say that's the undergraduate atmosphere, and of course there are all kinds of incredible exceptions, uh, brilliant students. When you go over to the McMurtry today, look at the paintings, uh, um, a colonnade of eight abstract paintings made by one of our studio ma majors, Maya. They're really fantastic. There's someone who's channeling Helen Frankenthaler and Joan Mitchell and Cy Twombly as a 21-year-old. So obviously, there are people here who get it and have it and don't need me or anyone else to tell them what art is. But in any case, what is the role of the faculty and administrators and, you know, what I noticed at Stanford is everyone is all for art, uh, well-meaning people are all for art, but there's, there's not necessarily a definition of what art is or what it might be. And, you know, borrowing from Goethe, I might say, um, um, the mediator of the inexpressible is art. You know, it is something that hasn't existed before the artist gave it shape. And that thing that is given shape is potentially transformative. And one doesn't have to be a mystic or as mystical as I am to believe in that the transformation can be political, social, and mystical, or one or the other. But it seems to me that in our kind of infinite curation and would-be artistry of all persons under the sun, that uh, the, this, the rareness of artistic creation and transformation it gets lost here. And what's so important then is to defend and articulate that and to give a hopeful vision of what that is. What is art history? An equally important question. Art historians are supposedly the people, so I've heard it said that, uh, you know, on a tour, a bus tour of 15 people where everyone can see in plain view the thing before their eyes, say a building, uh, the art historian is the one of the 15 who starts to annoyingly describe what everyone can already see. But <laughs> obviously, I disagree intensely with that, with that characterization. I think what art historians do is put words to, uh, to things, uh, spoken and written, and the words illuminate something that would not be seen otherwise and that art history as a form of criticism and just um, eloquence uh, is as much of an ethically transformative potential in the world as the making of art. So art and art history go together beautifully uh, in my department, and the ideal of it is, is what I've just given you a sense of. Uh, what is history? You know, there's what is art, what is art history, what is history? Well, that's a very rich question here and a hugely important question here because I notice all the way from my daughter's uh, middle school and elementary school on up to Stanford, um, education is based a lot on uh, a, a kind of mirroring, you know. What is like you? What in the past is like you? And then that becomes a way to, presumably, to know about the past. Um, but I disagree. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, what I'm in the business of trying to teach my students as well as myself is what is not you? What is other than you? What is uh, foreign and strange, not just though as an otherness that remains permanently over there, but as an otherness that you take inside yourself and make a part of your own being. And that capacity, which is linked to empathy, it's linked to respect, but it's also linked to wonder, is, is what I try to teach. And um, so there's what is art, what is art history, and what is history? What is the otherness of the past? Um, what is the future of the past, you know? Um, do, our, do our students recognize that there is such a thing as a past? 
um, are the adults in their lives busy accelerating the diminution of the past? Um, it could be. So the future of the department, I think, is so, it's linked to a lot of great things, but I just want to mention one, which is, I see her up there, Connie. Um, the relation, the physical proximity now uh, between the museum, museums, the Cantor and the Anderson, but I'll focus here for the moment on Connie, just um, the physical proximity between the Cantor and the McMurtry, or yeah, that this is, this is huge. Um, Connie and I both arrived here in 2012. Uh, I've said to her, it's a coincidence that we just have uh, similar viewpoints. Um, we believe, I think, passionately in the same kind of things, the transformative power of art, the importance of art history, the importance of museums, um, the importance of um, slowness, of meditation, of contemplation and discernment as things that we can uh, instruct our students in and um, you know what what good fortune for me that I have such a good uh, co-conspirator here at Stanford so I'm very hopeful in a lot of ways and I'm honored to be in the lineage that Mona described and uh, may we uh, continue to make a difference here thank you Thank you very much. I, I think we have time if, for a few questions, if, if uh, Mona and Alex want to come up and people have questions to ask. Yes. Uh, speak loud and clear, because I won't hear enough to repeat it. Hmm? Any comment? <laughs> any, any further comments or questions? No? Well, then it's my uh, a, a great pleasure and, and privilege to thank uh, Mona Dugan and Alex Emeroff for wonderful talks and to thank the McMurtrys and for a, a wonderful building and to be thrilled uh, uh, the relationship with Stanford and the arts with, with, uh, uh, has become a much richer one uh, under the presidency of John Hennessy. And uh, and, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting situation, and, and the arts, I think both, both these talks uh, made uh, vividly clear how important the arts are to life. Thank you very much. All come to the reception. Thanks again. Just to direct everyone to the reception, uh, if you go out to your left, to your left, it's the inescapable, beautiful new building. Uh, we invite our members to come join us and walk around a little bit. Thank you. <laughs>